Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. Uh, today we have our uh, special guest, uh, David French, who uh, rejoins us again. Uh, David, hey, thanks for coming back. I appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me. Okay, there's a lot of things I want to talk about. Uh, obviously, I have to start off by talking about the fact that we have another mass shooting in America. The week after uh, eight people were killed in Atlanta, Georgia, we have uh, 10 uh, people who are killed at a grocery store in Boulder, Colorado. And I have to make a confession to you, David. I, I did a radio show for 23 years, mm -hmm. and these were the mornings that I hated the most after these shootings because it was so predictable. I mean, people are shocked and a lot of people are deeply emotionally moved. But, you know, within 15 minutes, the callers would go back to the, the cliches. They would go back to their corners and it would be the same old stuff over and over and over again. These cliches that substitute for... Uh, for thought. I mean, there was once a time we talked about bumper stickers. Bumper stickers were basically Cicero compared to <laughs> the thing right. that goes in. And I will tell you that I think the shooting at Sandy Hook kind of broke something in me. It, it, it was it was after that I just couldn't handle it anymore. So I, I'm just just as you know, full disclosure, I'm having a little bit of PTSD because of all of the just the shock and the horror, and then the incredibly you know, n dumbed down, politically yeah. paralyzed response. Do you, you know what I mean? I mean, that, that's, that's my take on, I just, uh, I would, I would rather do anything in the world rather than do a, a talk show the, the morning after one of these shootings. No, I, I totally understand that. I mean, what I've seen happen in the, in the discourse about these things is, it really has moved in from, okay, now we're going to have a very intense argument about guns, which, you know, it, which is sort of a classic policy argument, except really ratcheted up in an intent in emotional intensity because of the event. And it's now also turned into something else, which is we're going to, we got to wait and see who the person was, who the victims were. And then once we figure out all of that, then you have sort of two, con there's two things that happen at once. If it's somebody on the other side, sort of that kind of fits the identity markers for the other side, well, then now it's time to say, well, here's what this shooting says about them. Okay. And then if the person is kind of got some of the identity markers of being on your side of the, the you know, this great cultural divide, then your response is, how dare you think this says anything about us? Right. right. So, you know, and we do this all the time in all kinds of categories. I mean, if somebody is caught in terrible, terrible abuse and they're on the other side of the aisle, well, this is what your ideology and your culture leads to. And if somebody is caught in terrible, terrible abuse on your side, how dare you generalize about this crazy, terrible person on the basis of this one case? And so it's it turns into grievance in both directions. I have a grievance against you if the person belongs to your sort of identity side and I have a grievance against you if the person belongs to my identity side. Yeah. And it's sort of added this extra layer to an already very emotional, already very difficult kind of national conversation. And one last thing on this, I have long said that I don't think background crime rates are as much of a threat to gun rights as mass shootings are. And that, um, people that background crime rates are often a, um, spur for people to purchase guns and to, to try to protect themselves. Mass shootings hit in a different way. And I think, you know, it's one of the reasons why I have advocated in the aftermath of mass shootings for intelligently drafted, not every kind of red flag law is intelligently or well-drafted, but for well-drafted red flag laws, uh, is because I, for two reasons. One, I think they can actually stop mass shootings. Not all of them, nothing, no policy is ever perfect. I, explain what a red flag law is for our listeners. So a red flag law is a law that says that if a person exhibits um, a particular, sort of is demonstrating that they have dangerous intentions um, or is drifting in a, in, a, in a dangerous direction, that you can get a order that temporary, temporarily removes guns from their possession. A well-drafted law gives notice, an opportunity to be heard, a set time limit, uh, a burden of proof. You know, it does all of the things that you do for any kind of deprivation of a right, uh, temporary or permanent. You provide due process. Some of the more poorly drafted ones say, as soon as you suspect it, you can 
you know, you can grab that, the law enforcement can grab the guns without notice, you know, without an opportunity to be heard. And now there are certain emergency, emergency circumstances that, that might be necessary, but there should be prompt due process in that circumstance. But yeah, so what basically what it does is, you know, one of the things that we have seen about um, mass killings, not all the time, but time and time and time again, you there have been markers, there have been things where people have said, I was really worried about them, but because they didn't do something criminal or they didn't appear to be ready to be institutionalized um, for a, a mental health distress, people were helpless. There, there was nothing that could legally be done. And so you could sort of be, they might be waving red flags, but the law, there were no, there were no tools that the law had. And so this, what these red flag laws, they try to give the law a tool that it didn't have previously. What's the opposition to the the red flag law? Just the the thing that it could, the 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 argument that it could be abused by the government to take away someone's gun legitimate yeah. gun rights. Well, there's so there's two arguments. One is the sort of classic slippery slope argument that's deployed almost with any um, gun right, uh, you know, any sort of gun control legislation, which is this is first step until I don't, you know, look. I mean, um, that I'm less interested in that objection than I am to the due process objection, which. Um, is mainly deployed, I think, against some of the uh, the manifestations of red flags, law, red flag laws that are poorly drafted. It is a fact that you shouldn't have any constitutional liberty deprived without due process, and some of them allow the deprivation to occur so on such little evidence and for such a prolonged period of time without a depra- you know, without really meaningful due process. That I do think it presents a problem, but a lot of the rhetoric is overheated because. You know, look, our, our law is very used to having summary proceedings in emergency circumstances that do at least temporarily deprive you of your legal rights. So, for example, a um, domestic protection order, you know, some of these things that it can be gained very quickly in courts of law will provi- prevent you from being around your spouse, around your children. I mean, that's a very serious deprivation, and, and, and but in the circumstances of an emergency, and that's an accepted part of American law. And so adding this when there's clear indicators of potential violence, temporary deprivation, and due process, I think it can be, I think it can save lives and has a great advantage over some of the more sweeping gun control measures that often mainly end up burdening the rights of people who are law abiding and people who are not law abiding just brush them aside. They don't care. It's very individualized. It's it yeah, is targeted you know, death, at people who have exhibited death, behavior. Death also burdens the the the, the rights. Um, I guess I've become. I, know I haven't worked out exactly my position on all of this, but I, I have. I, I was I was kind of radicalized after after Sandy Hook, and I had a couple of run-ins with the NRA. And let me ask you this though, because you know I, I wrote this back in 2017 that you know Republicans have been you know have been outsourcing their thought leadership to the loudmouths at the end of the bar for a long time. But maybe the most extreme example was uh, on the issue of guns, where. The Republican Party really ceded control to the the NRA that built its brand on absolutism, and the the NRA sort of turned itself into the id of the right. Somebody asked me yesterday, well, with the implosion of the NRA and all of the problems they've been having, financial and et cetera, you know, does that mean that there's there's an opening? And my answer, or at least my, I'll be interested to your answer to this was not really because this has become part of our culture war that we have, you know, it, it's, it's no longer kind of a standalone issue. It's become this, uh, this tribal marker. And so that even though the, the NRA may be enfeebled, um, it still has this hold over the American right and, and therefore veto power over any real substantive, uh, common sense gun legislation. You know, I, I'll tell you this as somebody, I, you know, I own guns. I've, I've long, I've owned guns my entire adult life. Um, I, I value my second amendment rights as somebody who, you know, my family has faced threats and I'm great. And I'm grateful that I have the opportunity and a right to defend myself. But I'll say this, there is a difference between a support for gun rights and indulging in gun fetishes. Yes. Funny and, that you used the exact word that I was thinking of using, <laughs> the fetishization of guns. I'm sorry, go and, ahead. And, you know, so what's the difference? I mean, so one of the things that you've seen, and parts of the right, again, you don't, you don't want to paint with too broad a brush, but look, I mean, when you have members of the House of Representatives um, uh, doing media hits, 
with AR-15 sort of like crossed like swords in the background of the media hit, or like Donald Trump Jr. doing, you know, Twitter videos with just a, 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 a wall full of guns behind him. I mean, this is what I mean by a gun fetish. It's sort of, I am openly displaying firepower as a cultural marker. Yes. I'm openly displaying firepower as a, just as, as sort of a, it, as sort of like waving a particular cultural flag. And then the more guns you have, the more firepower you display, it's, it, what is it? What is that? Why is, what is the purpose for that? That is, all of that is saying is to a certain segment of Americans, I'm one of you, I'm not one of them. And, you know, the, and for an awful lot of people, again, if you're, if your project is persuasion, if your project is to say, look, what I advocate is responsible gun ownership for self-defense and, and, you know, and this is connecting with the constitutional, you know, history of the second amendment, um, then this sort of display of a massive amount of firepower does not broadcast to anyone in the country that all I'm concerned about is responsible self-defense. It sort of, it broadcasts an enormous amount of aggression. And now if you read some Twitter accounts, you'll know that that's quite intentional there. You know, there's some, some folks on Twitter and some folks who are just sort of have this view of this is, this is what happens if the culture war gets too hot. Well, look, look at that- what I've got. It, well, it, it, exactly. And, and you know, you live in Tennessee. I live in Wisconsin. And there's a very interesting divide here um, th- that I learned over the years. You you have the, the the NRA absolutist types, but then you have this really broad group of people who are sportsmen, people who are really responsible gun owners. And, uh, you know, it, it is dangerous to conflate the two of them. But I, I got into a really big fight with the NRA, you know, f- a few years ago. I don't know if I ever talked to you about this, where you know I'd been a big supporter of the Second Amendment. People you know, want to put that in context. So, for example, there was a long debate about whether we should have concealed carry permits in Wisconsin. We were one of the last states in the country to have that. And I was in favor of that. Um, with the assumption that you would have some sort of training and, and, and permitting process uh, behind that. And the legislation finally came up um, under, under a Republican governor. And the NRA suddenly decided, you know what, um, we don't want to have any requirements whatsoever. No training, no lessons, no practice, no permitting whatsoever. Just anyone can go out and carry, carry. Mm-hmm. Yeah, constitutional Con- carry. And I thought that was nuts. I mean, I, I, you know, people may disagree. I know that there are, you know, people who I respect who disagreed with me on that, but I push back on that. And the NRA just, I mean, they just came after me that I just didn't understand gun rights. And I'm sorry. I said, no, I'm sorry. I, I, if you want to have gun rights, then then encourage people to think that the people with guns know what they are doing. These are responsible people as opposed to, yeah, I'm going to do this without any limit whatsoever. And what I found was that the vast majority of responsible gun owners in the state of Wisconsin sportsmen said, yeah, absolutely right. I don't want somebody carrying a gun, you know, next to me if they don't know how to use it, you know, if they haven't had, you know, some sort of a permit of any kind whatsoever. And uh, they were kind of blown away. So this was one of those issues where I thought that y- you you had the extremists and the absolutists who claimed to speak for gun owners but didn't. But I got to go back to the point that you're making that really but does bother me. This the gun is fetish, but also the gun as a uh, you know potential political threat. You know, I remember you know a few years ago, you know, people would start you know calling into my show. And saying, well, the, the main reason for the Second Amendment is so that we can, you know, fight against the government, or that we can defend our rights against the government. And I would always, you know, ask, well, so who are you going to shoot? You know, cops. Uh, you know, the army has more guns than you do. You, you know, they they have they have they have fighter jets and they have tanks and things like that. I mean, you really think that's going to work? But this has become a thing now. And you you I mean, you, when you see these armed protests, what happened in Michigan? What happened on the Capitol? We are coming to a point where the gun as political fetish is a real problem that we have to confront somehow. And I don't know how to do it. Well, yeah, it's a fetish and it's an instrument of, op- oh, an instrument of intimidation. So, yes. so again, okay, let me back up and say, I'm a supporter of gun rights. I'm a supporter of concealed carry rights. And one of the stories of the United States over the last 30 years or 40 years for those people who are on the right, who say, all we ever do is lose. We never win. The transformation of gun laws in this country to uh, has been one of the more remarkable undertold stories 
in American life. I mean, if you go back to the mid 1980s, late 1980s, very in very few states did you have a right to a concealed carry, mm-hmm. in very few. Now it's almost all of them, and many states have this constitutional carry doctrine you just talked about. But what's happened with some subcultures is that the open display of firepower has become a marker, not just a cultural marker, but it's become a very intentional uh, act of intimidation. You know, so you see people showing up to these protests with AR-15s. They kind of look like they're cosplaying, being SEALs. And, you know, a lot of it looks ridiculous. A lot of it looks silly. Um, You know, if you have actual military experience, uh, you know, you look at these individuals and, you know, their kit, their setup, and you're just like, you're rolling your eyes. But, you know, I tell you what looked silly and what looked ridiculous started to look a lot more ominous during some of the lockdown protests. And then as we, you know, we we heard of the plot against Governor Whitmer, then what's ominous turns really deadly serious. And, you know, and then you get into the January 6th and thankfully none of the people were, you know, there was there were so far as I know, no open displays of AR-15s because that would have they could have been immediately arrested in D.C., But this notion that sort of says we are in a a culture war and when things get really serious, we are the ones with the guns is a sentiment all over social media. And, And Charlie, I don't think they really truly mean turning the guns on, um, the cops. Like, I, I think they still think of sort of the cops as basically, I, I'm talking about this sub- subculture is still basically on their side. Although hell hath no fury like these guys, if the cops try to block them from the Capitol. Right, we saw that. We saw that, but I think they still generally think of the cops on their side. I think what they're actually really talking about are situations like what you had in Kenosha, Wisconsin, and how some of this subculture has really elevated and valorized this kid who, you know, who used his own AR-15 um, against uh, some of the violent protesters. So I think that that's what you're talking about is violence in the streets against the competing factions and one side's going to be more armed. And, and that's one thing that I worry about a lot more than I worry about, say, some sort of like, uh, um, op- you know, organized militia insurrection against law enforcement. No, I, 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 I agree with you on that. And, and that we have more guns thing is uh, is very, very widespread. And I think Trump actually, you know, said that a couple of times, you know, our, you know, we're the people with the guns. And but again, you, you kind of wonder whether the, where that loose talk leads. I mean, now you keep talking about, you know, people keep talking about civil war and we have the guns and we, we you know, bring the AR-15. Well, OK, at some point when you pull the gun you know, are you prepared to use it? And what is your plan? And I'm not sure that people have thought about that, but it feels like it's almost unconsciously becoming more and more ominous, right? I mean, and I will tell you that if I showed up at a protest and there were a lot of people with AR-15s, unlike Ron Johnson, I'm not going to think these are good law-abiding citizens. I'm going to leave. (laughs) I'm not going to feel good. Especially, especially, you know, when when there were some armed protesters that showed up at some secretaries of state's houses. Yes during the election contest. And, and look, I mean, there's a difference in saying that someone, somebody has a right of open carry, you know, under state law, then therefore, because they have a right of open carry, open carry is never problematic or ominous. I guarantee you, if you're a, any reasonable, decent human being, if people show up to your house really angry with a ton of firepower on open display, it's going to be one of the most unsettling and frightening terrifying events of your entire life. And that's the point. Yes. That's the point is to do that. And that is 180 degrees opposite from the notion of, I have a right to own a gun in self-defense. Okay, let's just switch gears here. Uh, and I want to come back to something you wrote about the Atlanta shootings uh, in a little while. We talked about the purity culture. Your, your piece uh, over the weekend was really eye-opening for me. Um, and I gave it to my wife and she says, boy, I really now understand this, you know, something that, that had, you know, been, been very obscure before. But before we do that, I want to use your uh, legal acumen here uh, to explain the Sidney Powell defense. Sidney Powell, of course, being the Kraken lawyer who had uh, pushed all the conspiracy theories 
about the stolen election um, uh, that were that were amplified by the president of the United States. Uh, she was given a forum at the Republican National Committee. Many, many millions of Americans apparently believed some of the stuff Sidney Powell was saying. Now she's facing a billion dollar plus lawsuit from Dominion, the voting company that she uh, totally lied about. And it, her lawyer's defense now is basically, oh, come on. It was so ridiculous that nobody was actually going to believe it. Let me see if I can actually call this up. Sidney Powell argued Monday that she could not be sued for defamation for repeatedly promoting false conspiracy theories about the election being rigged because, quote, no reasonable person would believe that her comments were truly statements of fact. And she, she this is from BuzzFeed. Powell deflected blame to the Trump supporters who adopted the conspiracy theories and lies that she and other Trump allies pushed and that ultimately fueled the insurrection on January 6th. Her lawyers wrote that she was just presenting her, quote, opinions and legal theories on a matter of utmost public concern and that members of the public who were interested were free to look at the evidence and make up their own minds or wait to see how the evidence held up in court. So your thoughts, Sidney Powell basically saying, Hey, it was all just BS, you suckers. And if you believed it, that's on you, not me. Yeah, you know, in in precise legalese, her they argue, um, you know, there's a two step inquiry: is the statement one which can be proved true or false? And would reasonable people conclude that the statement is one of a fact in light of its phrasing, context, circumstances? And then it it says under these factors, even assuming arguendo that each of the statements alleged in the complaint could be proved true or false, no reasonable person would conclude <laughs> Only that the statements <laughs> were truly statements of fact. Charlie, this is important and it's not going to get enough coverage because I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. There will be a wave of laughter on Twitter. Yeah. We've already seen it. It's largely over. Um, there will be some reports, you know, mainly in mainstream media. There might be a tiny little mention of it uh, in on Fox, maybe. I don't know. Um, and then it'll be over. It'll be over. When these lies about the election, specifically from Sidney Powell, were hammered home to the conservative public day after day after day after day, and I saw friends of mine, people I've known for years, believe this stuff and put an enormous amount, not just an enormous amount of hope in her lawsuits, they elevated Sidney Powell as sort of a, a martyr to the cause, the fearless truth teller. And here they're admitting no reasonable person would conclude the statements were truly statements of fact. And it's just going to be wiped, washed away in a tidal wave of the news cycle. And the millions and millions and millions of people who believed and still believe all are part of this will probably not be aware of this argument. And, and that's what you know is so concerning to me about sometimes we'll, we'll have a wave of controversy followed later by the definitive debunking. And it's hard to have a more definitive debunking than the Sidney Powell herself arguing through counsel that no reasonable person could conclude that her statements were fact. And But the debunking will have no resonance by comparison to the lie. Mm. Yeah, it's okay. So I have a question about this. So her argument is that that even if everything I said is true, no reasonable person would have believed it. Now that has some meaning in law, correct? The term "no reasonable person." Right. Yeah. It's an, it's supposed to be an objective test. Okay. In other so words, whenever you, yeah. Okay. So what is a reasonable person? Because part of me wants to agree, <laughs> no reasonable person, and we were arguing that. You know, you have to be crazy to believe that these machines were rigged in this particular way. So in the eyes of the law, what what is that standard of the reasonable person who will listen to Sidney Powell and believe, that, yeah, you know, Hugo Chavez rigged the election from the grave? <laughs> yeah, you know, this goes back to the, it's it goes back to sort of something called the reasonable man standard or yeah. reasonable person standard, which is essentially what you're saying, what you're trying to avoid is. Um, a, a completely subjective standard that says, if anyone, if I can find anyone who believes the statements were a fact, then um, I can prove sort of, you know, say, for example, damages that, uh, you know, I argued that um, my argument was that Joe Biden 
uh, summoned forth a comet from the Andromeda galaxy. And like, if I could show that some person believed it, that that would be defamation. No, it's, it's to sort of cut off sort of the extremes and the, and the, um, unpredictability of subjective legal tests. So a reasonable person test is one that sort of says, okay, assuming a rational person possessed of their faculties and the ability to sift and discern between truth and falsity, um, assume that person, assume the way this, these allegations land with that person. And it's kind of hard to really define what a quote unquote reasonable person is, but the best way to describe it is what it's not. It's sort of not what any person would do or what any given person might believe, but a, you know, just sort of a stereotypical person possessed of reasonable, normal faculties, possessed of a reasonable, normal ability to discern truth or falsehood. Um, is this how, how would this land with that reasonable, normal person? And, mm -hmm. and so that's, it's, it's, you know, there's an element of subjectivity to that as well. But it's that that word is try is introduced in a variety of legal contexts to try to limit subjectivity, although you can't yeah. get rid of it entirely. So this is basically the Tucker Carlson defense as well. I mean, his lawyers at one point argued that the general tenor of his show, you know, should let people know that he's not stating actual facts about the topics and he engages in exaggeration and what they call non literal commentary. Uh, I think Alex <laughs> Jones once said that as well. But I, I would think that that you know. When I'm looking at what Sidney Powell is now saying, that makes a rather strong case for her disbarment, don't you think? Yeah, you 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 raise a very a very good point. And you know, I, let's connect this to something that sort of set the conservative side of the Twitter sphere on fire for a while uh, last week, or a couple of days ago, and that was this dissent from Judge Silberman in the DC oh, Circuit yeah. of Appeals, mm -hmm. who. When you cut through all of his rhetoric, what he was really wanting to do was undermine the New York Times v. Sullivan legal standard that says, essentially, if you're a public figure, you have a heightened burden of proving defamation. You have to prove that you know the news organization, whoever was defaming you, you allege was defaming you, um, had actual malice. And so he was saying, this has no basis in American constitutional law, no basis in originalism, and boy, it really empowers the liberal media. And, you know, you saw the right side of Twitter going, yeah, that's right. Look at, read this. This is amazing. But I was thinking, wait a minute, if you um, pull back the New York Times v. Sullivan standard, yeah, there are media organizations that are going to become more vulnerable to defamation suits. And one of them is named Fox News um, that's actually subject to, and some of its personalities subject to massive defamation suits right now. And so- um, you know, that's a, sort of a classic um, be beware careful. of owning the libs. You might own yourself kind of argument. So speaking of the media culture, I know that you were on with uh, Brian Stelter on CNN over the weekend about the the media culture. And I thought you touched on a number of, of different things, including the need for a little bit of grace in dealing with uh, with transgressions. But we are in this very strange moment where at the same time you have people who live in fear of saying something that will get them canceled at, at the same time that you also have people who go on the air really looking to say the most outrageous possible things in order to advance their career. You know, kind of an absolute never apologize, totally shameless, own the libs culture. You know, you're seeing that with, you know, Rush Limbaugh uh, being replaced by Dan Bongino. Um, it, it is an interesting moment for the media culture, and it doesn't seem like we're trending in a very positive direction. No, no. Yeah. I mean, what what we I said this on our uh, dispatch podcast the other day, and I said, I think this is the way cancel culture really works. And that is that left can cancel left. Right can cancel right. But left when left tries to cancel right, it generally empowers the right. And when right tries to cancel left, it generally empowers the left. Yeah. And so that's one of the things that you often see out of some of these really over the top. Um, now, there are circumstances, for example, you know, my friend Ryan Anderson's book, when it was yanked from the shelves of Amazon, um, you know, that was a an action of the left trying to cancel a book on the right that I just think was flat out wrong, just flat out wrong. And when they explained what the reason why they did it, 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 they they just completely mischaracterized the book. But as a general rule, when you're talking about sort of the left canceling the right, 
on, if you're on the right and somebody comes at you from the left, it's generally a, a good day for you <laughs> because yes. it's going to elevate your voice. You get to stand against the other side. They are it's trying to be, silence me. Exactly. You know, that's one of the reasons why when people get criticism from the left, they even powerful people who the left can't cancel, um, they immediately stampede to cancel, look at cancel culture and they wrap themselves in that cancel culture mantle. There's an enormous sort of, um, you're, you're tapping into an enormous um, uh, right wing level or level of right wing anger against cancel culture. And if you can cloak yourself in that, they tried to cancel me. It empowers you tremendously. And similarly, if someone's on the right and they just go hard after someone on the left, you'll sometimes see that rally around the flag. You know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Even when the person on the left is not great, who's really done some bad stuff. I mean, you know, there was a lot of support for Cuomo in New York that was deeply misplaced in part because the first people to come after Cuomo were those on the right who were uh, attacking his nursing, his deeply misguided nursing home policy. So when right goes after left, left goes after right, it's often empowering to its targets, sometimes wrongly empowering to its targets. But when you are canceled internally on by your own tribe, by your own team, that's when it that's when you really, you know, that's when it really can be damaging. And and so like this this woman at Teen Vogue who Yeah, had, Alexi McCammond. Exactly. She had bad tweets. They were bad tweets when she was 17 years old. And that there was no grace, there was no forgiveness, in spite of the fact that her her career had exhibited no element of racism, anti-Asian bias, gone, canceled. Or, you know, D David Shore, this analyst, mm -hmm. who very innocuously and accurately wrote that, look, public opinion is more moved by nonviolent protests than violent protests. Canceled, you know. And you can just go down the line of these things where it's sort of intramural, where it's intranecine conflict. And that cancel culture has real teeth. And, you know... <laughs> I would note that um, you know a lot of a lot of writers who are sort of left of center are now migrating to Substack after some of these mm -hmm. internal cancellation efforts. Well, we were there before they were. <laughs> yep. And and it's a you know there there was a a right wing cancel culture that's very intense, very intense. Which is so ironic because, you know, it's 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 like there's a, I guess it's sort of a gaslighting here because the right-wing cancel culture has been very, very active, very effective, very, very unforgiving. And and yet you 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 listen to some of the people who are using the term cancel culture and it's, it's as if that never existed, right? It, it's like we've never done exactly what we've spent the last five years doing. Well, I mean, some of the people complain about cancel culture from the right are some of the most um, vicious practitioners of it within their own yeah. ideological tribe. I mean, so, you know, some of the people who complain the most about big tech and intolerance and how dare they, they don't like free speech, are e busy every other tweet, every other op-ed, whatever they're doing, trying to humiliate and shame and hector and mob people out of their careers, out of their jobs, out of any kind of uh, public reputation on the right. I mean, so, you know, part of me looks at all of this and says, you know, look, um, <laughs> there, there, uh, you know, I, I look at it and I say there is a, there's a tribe of illiberal authoritarians on the left. There's a tribe of illiberal, illiberal authoritarians on the right. And I honestly think, Charlie, only, only those on the right only small L liberals on the right can defeat the illiberals on the right. And only small L liberals on the yeah. left can defeat the illiberals on the left. No, I, I agree. And, and, and one, one more point that, uh, that I thought you made very, very effectively was the why we also – there's no apology culture. Because right. apologies – and this, this, by the way, is true on I, I think both the, the, the left cancel culture and the right cancel culture – is with a lack of grace, apologies are not accepted. And simply yeah. make you more vulnerable. So, I mean, there are people who I think decide 
what the hell? Why should I bother apologizing? I'm going to be crucified anyway. So, um, and there is, you know, when we're, we're seeing this over and over again, the, 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 this culture of shamelessness where I am not giving an inch, but there's a reason for that, isn't there? Yeah, there, there is a reason for that. I mean, again, if you're talking about the cancel, the, the sort of the worst elements of cancel culture, what happens is if you apologize, what it does is, is it creates a second news cycle um, emphasizing how wrong you were. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so there's number one, the allegation. Look at the allegation against this horrible person. You know, let's dwell on that allegation. Then the person comes under fire and the person apologizes. Well, look, they have admitted, they have now admitted that what they did was terrible and wrong. What are you going to do? Where's the accountability? And it's interesting, uh, you know, Charlie, you, you and I are old enough to remember when we almost, it seemed as if that especially if, if, you know, people were of sufficient stature that, um, we were, we were so enamored by apologies in our culture. It was like, everybody could have a second or third or a fourth chance. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it was almost a kind of a stereotype or a, uh, it was, it was kind of a, uh, um, you know, it just, a, a confirmed pattern that you could almost do anything and you could have a second act in American life. And that has completely reversed in some parts of America. That is completely reversed. And that is you get one chance. You get one chance. And if you blow your chance, it doesn't matter if you're 17. It doesn't matter the circumstances. It doesn't even matter if the initial reporting was kind of wrong. You still, you've, that chance is over. It's it. That's, that's, it's done for you. Because if you apologize, all you've done is you've confirmed your wrongness. Yeah, and so that's exactly right. And of course, it's become a blood sport, and so and the apology is perceived to be blood in the water, right? And the moment the moment you do that, the moment you bleed out, then suddenly you know, then it's you know, there's 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 no defense. And the Alexi McCammon case, we keep talking about it because it was so outrageous because it was 10 years old it was she was yeah. 17 years old and had apologized for years for it i mean this is not like a new thing she had apologized back in 2019 and none of it made a difference okay so i want to switch back to something that i had uh, previewed you had a piece um over the weekend about the purity culture in uh some churches um that you thought was an important factor to understand now before we get into the atlanta thing you know we we talked about this a little bit yesterday you know was it anti-asian hate was it uh was it sex addiction was it we don't know there's a lot of complication none of these things are mutually exclusive but there's clearly an element of this purity culture that sees women as this dangerous threat that needs to be understood in the context of Atlanta, but I also think just just in in general to understand that it's out there. So, could you talk to me a little bit about this and um, and how you think it relates to to what's happening out there? Yeah. So, um, you know this this is something that um, really bubbled up from sort of the Christian quarters of the internet up and exploded into mainstream media with Washington Post reports and New York Times reports, but. What it's rooted in, and, and again, we don't know. We don't know if there was an anti-Asian element to this shooting. I'm not what somebody who's going to say, "Oh, well, we've identified the his sex addiction motive, so therefore there must not be any other motive." Let's wait on that. Let's wait right. on that. I mean, exactly. You know, for one one thing, his actions provide their own testimony. He shot Asian women, so was there an element there? There's some evidence there was, but let's just wait on that. But what we do know is that he has said that he suffered from a sex addiction. We do know he was had received treatment for it at a place called Hope Quest and another institution, and that he's told police that he shot the women because, quote, they were a temptation for him he wanted to eliminate. Now, this is a kid who grew up in a Baptist church, and, and as soon as those words, they were a temptation for him that he wanted to eliminate, sort of hit the public, an awful lot of Christians, like, all of a sudden, it was like that. What for an awful lot of Christians, what happened is they said, "I've heard this rhetoric before, not to this extreme kind of action, not this extreme kind of murderous rage, which is thankfully a a a, a small a, a tiny an exception to a rule, but they have heard this w- rhetoric before. And where have they heard this kind of rhetoric of women as tempters?" of Christian men before in within a purity culture context. And so what I wanted to do, because of course, anytime you have an argument about religion, it gets dumbed down really fast. Mm -hmm. (laughs) 
is to try to talk about what is purity culture. Like when, when people hear, when Christian women in particular hear the words, they were a temptation for him he wanted to eliminate, what are they, what is that calling back to? And so one of the things I wanted to do was say, look, okay, purity culture is not a synonym for just traditional Christian teachings about sexual morality. Purity culture is not a synonym for the belief that sex should be reserved for marriage between a man and a woman. That's just traditional, small o orthodox Christian teaching. Now, what purity culture refers to is an elaborate kind of extra biblical teaching that was often accompanied by written, you know, purity rituals and other things. It became popular in the 1990s. And it was designed to build sort of safeguards of sexual purity in Christian communities and in Christians, especially Christian young men and women. And and I wanted to describe what some of that was, but, I, you know, some of these rituals like purity balls and purity pledges and purity rings and courtship rules and things like that. But what I wanted to say was, uh, whatever the kind of the form of ritual you could tell the toxic form of purity teaching by two things. One was that it emphasized sexual sin as sort of a uniquely damning sin, as a uniquely dangerous, uniquely terrible, life-defining sin. So that if you committed sexual sin, something about you changed permanently. And I, I, t- I talked about how uh, some camps and youth pastors would pass around a brand new penny and then like a penny that had been in circulation for a while and was dingy and dark. And, and they said, so the grand, brand new penny is you if you're pure. And the dingy and dark penny is if you if you have sex. And really showed people that there was like a permanent change of condition in the face of sexual sin. And then the other thing that purity culture did is it put an enormous burden on women to protect men from their own beauty. And so the idea was that women are making men sinful by the way that women look. And, and yeah, yeah, and that was, you know, that's the quote unquote, remove temptation element of this. Mm -hmm. You know, when he's talking about shooting these people, that's a hyper extreme example, hyper extreme. But when people heard that remove temptation, that echoed back to what an awful lot of people had been taught for years and years and years to very damaging effect. You have an illustration in your piece of the eye traps that are yeah. handed out to, to, to women, like different kinds of clothing, and you're supposed to identify this is why it's provocative. And if you wear this, you are going to be tempting some man. And I have to say, they all look pretty modest to me. So <laughs> yeah. I would have failed the eye trap thing. Yeah. So th- this actual illustration came uh, from somebody who was formerly a part of a, uh, a Bill Gothard Ministries. Now, Bill Gothard, for people who don't know, was somebody who kind of burst on the scene in the 70s, became very popular, was filling arenas in the 80s um, and early 90s, uh, was a very, in in particular in homeschool circles, was a very influential person. I mean, hundreds of thousands of families followed his teaching. And he, you know, put, he had very elaborate rules and he, he put out these, this chart and the charts dated, you know, it's like 1980s dress, but you would look at it and you'd say every single one of these pictures, the person is very modest. Mm-hmm. But what he was talking about were, was there anything in your clothing that would distract from the person's face? And if there was anything in the clothing that would distract from a person's face, that's an eye trap. And you have to avoid eye traps because you are responsible for male purity the and, woman is responsible for male purity. Well, you know, of course, there's going to obviously there's responsibility for the guy as well, but the woman also bears the burden of helping the guy out. <laughs> and so, how do you help the guy out? You help the guy out by um, the kind, you know, the kind of clothing that you're going to wear. You're going to help the guy out by, you know, you're you're also you bear a burden for him as well, and. And, you know, one thing that I point out in the, um, in the piece that I wrote is there on both of these prongs, you know, one, is there any kind of sin that defines a Christian forever? And the answer to that's no, absolutely not. I mean, there's an actual, you know, Isaiah one, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow, though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. You are not defined by your sin in basic Christian theology. You're defined by Christ. 
And then do women pollute men's hearts? Is the sight of a woman the source of male sin? Again, this is the words of Jesus. Evil comes from within. Out of the heart of man come evil thoughts, sexual morality, etc., etc. All these evil things come from within. So in other words, um, basically, you cannot... You cannot oppress women enough to protect men because, from themselves because, because women the problem are is a women. threat, and you right. need to eliminate that threat in any way. And again, I'm not, I'm, I'm now going to get a little bit too far, but in, in terms <laughs> of the clothes and everything, that that if this woman is really, really tempting you, if she's tempting you to damnation to become permanently sullied, and so, you know, in a so we say an unbalanced psychology that can translate into an, what we saw. Right. And again, it's, t- you have to totally emphasize this, that what we saw was hyper extreme. Right. <laughs> it is, it is not like that if you went to Bill Gothard seminars or if you went to any kind of purity rally in the, t- in early two thousands that you're sort of primed for murder. Um, the reason why this came up was the idea that the killer expressed resonated with ideas that people had heard for a very long time that were deeply harmful to an awful lot of people. And, and basically, you know, the, the way I put it in my piece is that, look, if you're going to define a person by their sexual sin, it's just going to cultivate misery. Um, when you define a woman or you place a woman in a position of guarding a person's heart, it can cultivate misery for the woman and also sometimes in extreme edges, even abuse. And I've seen that in real life circumstances that have nothing to do with mass killings. And then sometimes when a person's heart is especially dark, when a person is a, is a, especially malicious, it can cultivate murderous rage And so, you know, this is one of those things where it was the idea the killer expressed that caused a lot of people to to realize that that idea, and he took it to an extreme, that idea is something that they had heard a lot in their lives and had caused harm in their lives. And that's one of the reasons why it triggered such a, um, really, honestly, if you listen to some of these accounts from women around the United States, some people who are still in the church and some people who've sadly left the church, a lot of anguish, a lot of anguish bubbled up as a result of this. This is amazing. It's, it's, it it sort of reminds you of, of what we don't know about one another in terms of (laughs) various cultures and attitudes, which seem so, so alien, but then, then every once in a while we'll burst onto our consciousness in ways that we, you know, have, have a hard time grasping. David French, thank you so much for taking the time to join me. I really, really appreciate it. It's always good. I, I have so many other things to talk about, but um, I think we've covered a lot this uh, this morning. Yeah, well, thanks so much. Uh, always fun to be with you, Charlie. Really appreciate it. And thank you all for listening to today's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We will be back tomorrow and we will do this all over again.